So they say policemen never get or seem to be getting younger every day. So, so for the audience here, can I just I'll say wealth managers seem to be getting younger as well. I, I'm an obvious exception to this. If you were going to have music walking into this, who would it be by for that track for the audience here? The Who, exactly. So when I said that as a possible suggestion, my colleagues, who may be more youthful than me, uh, turned around and went, Who? And I went, Yeah, the Who. No, the Who. Oh, but Who? So anyway, enough of the dad jokes. It sounded like a whole bunch of owls. The key thing is how quickly we forget our past. So kicking off, George Hegel, the uh, famous German philosopher and uh, teacher of Marx. There you are, wealth management presentation, and we're already on to Marxism. But the only thing that you learn from history is we learn nothing from history. Now, that was refined a little bit further as we've known more about the human brain and behavioural sort of traits that we have. So Professor Margaret Macmillan points out that actually we do kind of learn from history, but we really overemphasise the bits that we like. So I was going to do quite a high-tech presentation, so I'm now going to attempt to do something in front of the audience here, which is slightly more low-tech, but just to see if we can prove this. We have... A magic trick. There you are. You thought you had a clown, but you've actually got a magician. Right. As you can see, holding up a set of cards at the moment, and in no way is this going to influence you. But I am now going to ask you to pick one of these cards and focus very hard on the card that you want. So you can see, obviously, we've got red queens in there. We've got black jacks, various other things. So if you just focus on that card in there, and in no way will that uh, what I'm telling you, and will that earlier photo influence your decision? I'm now magically going to shuffle this. There you are. Look at the high tech. One last chance. I will have now removed your card. It's gone. It's correct, isn't it? Great. <laughs> How did I do that for an entire audience? <laughs> because they're different cards. You've all focused. <laughs> I've picked the near-identical one in the suit. So as much as it looked roughly the same, you have focused very much because I told you to focus on these things. Why is that important? Because we have a whole load of cognitive biases. And as you know, we're owned by Raliant, who is a uh, quantitative investor, so that obviously means very mathematical. But one of the problems we have is mapping humans, because humans can often do things that are very illogical to computers, but actually makes a lot of sense. And as I put at the bottom there, one of the most important things is your brain's actually wired to keep you alive, not to necessarily keep you happy while you're doing it. For anyone that's worked for a large investment bank, they can absolutely confirm that for you. So we have a whole series of things in there that we're just kind of uh, guilty of, and I am as much as everybody else. But you overweight recent events rather than historic ones, anchoring because you saw a price for something, oh, that house was worth this, or that asset was worth that. It must be worth that. It's cheap now. Uh, consistency bias, which is another one that, because it hasn't happened before, it can't happen because I've never seen that before. You know, Russia can't invade Ukraine. Discomfort bias. We tend to do things that actually reduce discomfort rather than promote happiness. Think of that the next time you deal with somebody with a Ferrari. Just think that is one unhappy person sitting in an extremely expensive car. So I know some of you own that, so they always should be buying British given the state of the economy. So uh, hyperbolic discounting. Another one, long name for just basically we want our gains immediately rather than putting things off that are uncertain in the future. So why is that important? I know many of you unbelievably, we'll have investments with other funds, and we are recording this. <laughs> so you'll be able to see this, but you don't have to put your hands up. But if you've had an outperformance so far this year, it's because it's full of crap. <laughs> Literally everything that's rallied this year, I've put the dash for trash, or uh, the British expression, which I obviously can't use on the uh, presentation, is the flight to sh so when you actually look at the things that have massively outperformed so far this year, expensive software, stocks that absolutely everybody else hated, so the professional investor market thought these were rubbish, uh, non-profitable companies, or meme YOLO stocks. So if you don't know what they are, ask your children or grandchildren, but they will be just things that they found on the internet and they thought it was a really good idea to invest in them. What's generally not done so well is actually safe, boring stuff. And this all seems very, very odd, doesn't it? That why should this junk be sort of rallying? Well, actually, it's very consistent with history. Because we have a model. 
We have a model, and it's not just mine, it's been observed over time, that you get this strange pattern in investment markets. So you get this move from institutional investors, so that's professional investors, suddenly your meme stocks, or it's in the paper, you should have all these investments in your portfolio. Then it starts going up, it goes up more, then we get a peak. Then you get this short downturn movement, and then about what they call the return to normal. Sometimes on academic literature, they call it an echo bubble. So oddly enough, when you look at all that stuff on the previous thing, all the stuff that had done well previously, is now doing well again, which is very much consistent with an echo bubble. Then potentially the market rolls over. So just remember that general shape. It, and it really does impact people that should know better. So this is the NASDAQ in, as you can see, uh, mid-1990s through to 2003, which was a big bust. And again, you can see it's got that shape. You've got a bit of a wobble, top peak, things come down again, bounce back up, and then we get a larger sell-off that takes a couple of years. Now here, I've taken the example of probably the world's most successful fund manager, somebody called Stanley Druckenmiller. And as you can see, Druckenmiller thought things were too expensive. So proving Keynes's old expression that the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. He thought this was silly, so he shorted. So he sold a whole bunch of stocks that he did own. $600 million later, uh, he was out of pocket, and he decided actually he did like these stocks. So he bought them, made a huge amount of money, as it bounced up to the top, realized it was getting really silly, sold everything. But then he got fooled. And you can see he bought back in and lost $3 billion in six weeks. But as you can see at the bottom here is, what was I meant to learn from this? What I, I already knew what I wasn't supposed to do. I was a complete basket case. That's always a good sign, isn't it, when they're managing your cash. So I learned not to do it again, but I already knew that. This is an even older example, so the data is a bit stranger. But again, you've got broadly that same pattern. This is Sir Isaac Newton. And he's famous for this expression, I can calculate the motion of heavenly bodies, but not the madness of people. This is exactly where it came from. He went bust speculating. He genuinely went bust with the South Sea uh, bubble. And as you can see, he bought in, sold out early. All our friends were making, or his friends were making money. So he decided to go all in, caught the top, exited, and basically went bust. So even though you're a professional investor or you're very smart, it's very, very hard not to learn from history. It's very, very hard to be patient when this stuff is going on. So why am I telling you this at the moment? This is the NASDAQ and the S&P at the moment. So you can see, strangely enough, there seems to be a pattern that we can see. So we've had the wobble, particularly around 2000 and sort of uh, uh, 20 with the uh, COVID, but there was already one previous to that. And in terms of the NASDAQ, we've already seen that movement, we've seen that sharp down, and we're beginning to start seeing that recovery again. The S&P looks as bad if it's on the same axis, but obviously it hasn't been as extreme as the NASDAQ. So we can already see, oddly enough, you've got two of the key things you're looking for. You've got rubbish rallying, and you've got or fine investments if your other investment managers are pitching it to you. Um, or you've got, and you've got the general shape that you would expect to see in an echo bubble. The other thing that is classic, so when we go back, you see there, who buys most at the top? The public. Who is buying most of this at the moment? It's the great American public, God bless them. So um, as you can see there, there are all times highs in terms of investment, and they are even accounting for their highest ever level of overall market turnover. So as a very famous market strategist, he ran Merrill Lynch's research department for about 30 years, and he's got various investment rules, and they're worth reading uh, because you know, they're sort of time honored and he's done all this stuff. The public buys most at the top, and the least at the bottom. And you can see that. And what have we got at the moment? The public is supporting the market and they're buying stuff that has the least level of fundamental support. So we've got two of the key features. We've got the shape, we've got the rubbish, and we've kind of got the public that's supporting that. So what do the fundamentals look like? Well, it depends at what you're looking at. So don't worry if you uh, have drunk too much wine or you're worrying that you've drunk too much wine. It is something that is generally an optical illusion. It's not actually moving, but it actually gives you that impression. The point I'm making is it really depends on what you're looking at. So you'll see a lot of economists saying about interest rates and they're talking about you know, various measures of inflation. By the way, there is no working model of inflation. 
by any economist, so it's a guess. So the moment you see people making confident predictions about what it's going to do, it's a guess. But the key thing is it very much depends on what you look at. But if you strip it down and look at the key thing, and I've taken this chart from uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, or whatever they call themselves these days, uh, but every time you've had sharp increases in interest rates, you have a fundamental problem in the market somewhere. Something has generally gone wrong. So you can see, um, with the exception of the early 1920s, which was obviously because you had the, the post-war boom, which America benefited from, but broadly, every time rates have gone up, there's been some kind of disturbance in the market. And as you can see, it's become more frequent as the economy has become more levered. Why does this matter? So for anybody that came for a nice lunch, and as you know, we have a bit of a mission to inform, to explain uh, how we do things, um, you can pay no attention for the next five minutes. Well, I'll go through something slightly more technical, or you can catch it up uh, on the recording. But this is, in essence, a very simple way of how the city or Wall Street will look at company earnings. So they will break it down into the various component parts. And I know many of you are entrepreneurs and know this even better than I ever will. But if you look through the various key moving parts for how to make that calculation, you'll see that a lot of those moving parts are being impacted what's happened at the moment. So the first most important thing is what is revenues doing? And obviously recessions tend to lower that, which is why there's a high correlation between recessions and uh, stock market prices going down. Inflation tends to pick up costs, but it very much depends what your business is and how your cost base is arranged. We still think there's a reasonable chance given that we have no model like anybody else, that there is more wage inflation still to come through. Higher rates increases financing costs. Higher rates also leads to uh, changes of how the city and Wall Street will look at investment propositions. So this is the second and uh, uh, penultimate. You'll be glad to hear of my slightly technical charts. But if you kind of think of the bottom line on that chart there, which is what they call the free cash flow. So if you strip everything out, how much cash does this company produce for me? So you can see on this example I've taken here, we've got that number there. So for simplicity's sake, I've changed that to 100. So that's the free cash flow at 5% discount rate. So if I kind of work out what, what that return is worth per year. Now, the discount rate obviously moves with interest rates. There's a couple of other factors, but interest rates is one of the big component factors. If you can get 5% in the bank or with government bonds, why on earth would you want to start investing in something riskier in stocks unless it can pay a lot higher return than that? So that's the simple thing to think about. So when interest rates are low, people will take more risk because the value of those future cash flows is potentially worth more. Particularly the final cash flow, which is an absolute guess, but very, very important if you're investing in profitless tech because the company might not make enough profit to now, but in a few years' time, apparently, it's going to be fantastic. So when you discount that at a much lower number, that is potentially worth a lot more. So those companies do well when interest rates fall. Double that rate, and you can suddenly see the value, which is the bottom left-hand corner, goes down. And you get a particular movement at the far end with regards to the terminal rate. So companies that produce cash early on boring companies that actually do boring things, that actually really make real money, um, tend to be much more favoured. And all the stuff that we've seen been doing pretty well in the last three months tends to do a lot worse. Even though the rates are going up, people are buying them, even though the maths tells you your probability, your history, your chance of making money out of that is actually going down. That was the boring part. Well, in fact, probably most of my presentation may well be boring, you've decided. But that was the technical part over. So what are we doing about it? As everybody that's been here before, you'll know that my esteemed young colleagues, impaired as they are by their youth, like to um, make fun of the fact that there's usually some nautical uh, reference in there. So we are expecting rough seas. Yeah, so we're expecting, as I said last time, there's going to be a bit of bouncing around in the market. So what have we done? we've reduced the risk exposure on both the equity and the bond side of your portfolios. The equity portfolios, for the reason that I showed with that discounted cash flow, we've moved again much more to highly cash generative companies because the value of that cash that comes out of the company is worth a lot more than it used to be. These are generally called value companies or value stocks. 
our fixed income portfolio remains very short term because we expect rates to carry on with upward pressure. And again, we're taking very limited credit exposure. We've also had a dollar bias in the portfolio that you've known for a while. You still have time to sell, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we've also still got a dollar bias in there, which I'll go through. And we're offering, obviously, a couple of new products. So but most of you are aware of the short-duration bond portfolio. We've started to offer some venture capital. Um, there's possibly a couple more that you'll see this year. So we've kind of de-risked your portfolio a bit. We're remaining fairly defensive. The fixed income part of the world has actually sold off quite aggressively in the last six weeks. So that part is certainly uh, performing. And that should ultimately, for the same reason that as bonds go up in terms of how much interest they have to pay to get people to buy them, that should reprice if you think about that cash flow calculation. Just a lot of people ask about sterling. I'm not going to go through all this. These charts for, uh, I know there's a bunch of other professional investors in the room, but these charts are all from something called uh, Bloomberg, which is the uh, professional uh, trading platform that a lot of people use. And it's just essentially what has sterling done in previous recessions. And it's never outperformed the US dollar. So one of the reasons we're involved in it is not because we're taking an outright currency bet. It's because we want the liquidity. It is the world's reserve currency, but there are no examples of it outperforming. The only thing that came close was the early 1990s, which is the bottom chart on the left. And that's because John Major, as we all recall, had to keep pushing interest rates up. And then a uh, hedge fund investor called George Soros, along with everybody else with half a brain cell, um, worked out that this wasn't going to last. So you can see that you get this spectacular collapse in sterling when they finally start to catch uh, rates. So that's your four examples. It's even worse when you take inflationary markets, which is what we've got at the moment. The dollar has outperformed on the two previous occasions. I know people are going to ask, well, what about earlier than that? We've only had free floating exchange rates since the 1970s. So there's very limited examples of that. So that's one of the reasons why we still have a dollar bias in there. So what does this mean for all you guys? So we've told you what we've done with the portfolio. But just to quote Mark Twain, there's a high probability that history will rhyme, as he points out. It might not exactly repeat itself. Just remember there are biases. So you are likely to see a lot more negative headlines if we are correct. Review your wider investments, particularly the stuff that's doing very well at the moment, because that's not normally for a good reason. We're waiting uh, for the odds to basically move, because as you know, Raliant, our parent company, is very much mathematically driven. The herd often does the wrong thing at the wrong time. And we see that again and again and again over history. So I could ask you all about who was the first set of investors on my original model for bubbles. And I'm sure you all remember it was smart money. So not even professional investors who have to take a lot of business risk because it's very hard to outperform as a professional investor if all your peers are doing something slightly different because you, amazingly you have very short windows as an institutional investor. But the people that can be patient, the people that can be smart, the ones that can actually accumulate things amongst all the problems are generally defined as the smart money. You don't want to be Joe Public. You hire us not to be Joe Public for you on your behalf. You want to be the smart money. And that's potentially where we'll be coming back and saying, look, I know it looks a bit scary. I know there's a lot of negative headlines, but we think now's the opportunity. The, the numbers are in our favor. The maths are in our favor. So a lot to remember. And if there's one simple thing that if you can sum this all up, it can be summed up by this picture here. Do we know who this is? No, I don't either. I asked for a picture of the Fonz. <laughs> and if you ever wonder if our costs are too high, they wouldn't even give me a picture of the Fonz. Yeah? So instead, I had to get some person who isn't the Fonz doing a strange, spurious gesture to try and make this point. So I apologize. Next time, you know we're overcharging when I get a picture of the Fonz. But if you remember the Fonz, he was one of the kind of key characters out of a TV series called Happy Days. So we're all going to be like the Fonz. And I don't mean hang around in gents' toilets, wear black leather, and show excessive amounts of interest in your personal appearance, though I wouldn't judge. More importantly, the Fonz was famous for being cool, not being disturbed, and always getting what he wanted in the end. So what we're all asking you to be is, be like the Fonz, possibly not as cheesy as this guy here, but be cool, be patient, and we're going to get what we want in the end. And we're probably going to see that over the course of the next few months. And with that, I'm pretty much finished, apart from the fact 
I have to give you the usual compliance disclaimer <laughs> that even though you have paid me to look after your money, you can't actually listen to a word I say without having some serious concerns and doubts, and I may not be trusted. I know you're looking very unhappy there, sir, but I do have to tell you this. So that's all from me, and uh, thank you very much for listening to me, and happy to take questions. <laughs>